I do appreciate the fact that we recognize that it's very difficult to multitask. As a matter of fact, there will be some brain research that say it's absolutely impossible to multitask. That what you're doing when you're doing two things at once is you're compartmentalizing. And that if you're doing two things at once, like texting or sending messages to folks, you're probably missing out on the opportunity to have a discussion with others around the table or to at least kind of think things through. Think about your kids in your classroom that you're going to be seeing pretty soon. Uh, middle school kids are particularly known for this, uh, at least in my middle school where I was a principal and where I was teaching. Um, you could be talking, you could be presenting information to them, and a bird could sound out in the win outside the window, and all of a sudden they'd be lost in what you were saying. Or they would be thinking about something else that's like the dance that's coming up, and they would lost, be lost in what you were saying. So I'm going to encourage you to really stay focused with the people around your tables. I want to kind of set this up uh, for us in this way. You have two sets of uh, materials from me. You have a PowerPoint, which sometimes I never even give the PowerPoint. Uh, but you have it, just in case you want to take some notes along the way, but I will warn you right now, I sometimes move away from the PowerPoint. I view PowerPoints, I hope you do this too in your classroom, as a teaching tool, not as a read-along. Uh, if, if it was a read-along, you wouldn't need me here, okay? And they wouldn't need you in the classroom. So if you are one of those people that says, I need it neat and orderly, I want them to go slide by slide by slide, I'm just going to tell you that's not happening. All right, uh, matter of fact, I don't even have all of the same slides that you have um, that you'll see on the screen because I try to give you the things that are most important. You also have another set of materials for me and that would be some work, working things, documents that we'll be doing together. Um, I also wanna, I guess, put it this way. You will do some turning and talking and some knee to knee and shoulder to shoulder with folks. You will have a chance to think through some of the strategies you're going to use as teams and, and as a school in this concept of a professional learning community. Um, we will not have a chance, however, for us to pull ourselves away and meet as school teams. That will come later on back in your buildings. We just can't build all of that into a single day that's gonna have a two 20 minute breaks and an hour and a half lunch and actually get to the big ideas and answer any questions that you might have as well. So if you were looking for a chance to take this and then today have a meeting with your school, we just don't have the facilities nor the time to do it. We are limited by that. But that doesn't mean we won't be doing some great work as your district and as you all as a school embrace and continue wherever you might be on your journey. We call it a journey of um, being and implementing the professional learning community model. How many of you think you're on a journey in your career? Yeah, I, I mean, I was, a, I was in education, public education in Springfield, Missouri for 28 years. I had two years in Arkansas as a special education teacher. I only retired three years ago. When I retired, I kept working in education for the state of Missouri. I was a project director for the Professional Learning Communities Project in our state, which meant that every day I was out in schools in the center part of our state, helping them embed and implement and deal with the characteristics that are so critical to kids. The, the, the characteristics that adults need to embrace and need to have because we do this for the sake of kids. Make no mistake, when we hear these big ideas, I never lost sight of the reason that we took these big ideas, reflected on our actions, put some things in place because I thought, you know what? This is better for kids if we will work collaboratively. This is better for kids if we think about a big idea that says, how about focusing on learning not just teaching. Why isn't it a big idea that we would put in place that says, and we'll hold ourselves accountable when kids struggle? Or when kids do well, we'll hold ourselves accountable to taking them to the highest level. So as a teacher for eight years, and then a principal for 21 years at all levels in Springfield, Missouri, I was a high school principal, a middle school principal, a junior high principal, a K-8 principal. I was even an elementary principal for part of my career. And in my journey, I found out very quickly I was only doing what I knew how to do. So even at 28 years in the business, I was still learning that this is still a journey. No one would ever have claimed that I was a dinosaur of the group. Never once would someone say, Tim's just riding it out. I didn't believe that's why I took the job. I didn't believe that's why we were supposed to be in education in the first place. So my first and foremost belief is be on a journey. 
realize that we're only doing what we know how to do and that sometimes if we're willing to stop and reflect on our practices, we might actually look deeply into those. We might actually question some of the things that we do. I had a teacher come up just yesterday, wonderful teacher. She says, I was, Tim, I'm 22 years into this. I attended the academy and I'm gonna tell you, I went back, totally changed the way I thought about kids and what I thought about my job. I started holding my kids accountable for their work. I didn't let them off the hook. It was amazing how all of a sudden these kids would start doing the work because they knew there was a consequence if you didn't do the work. And the consequence in the past, she says, I would just put zeros in the grade book. Now they have to do the work. They miss an opportunity. If they get it, they have, there's a privilege that's associated to that. She says, it's amazing. My low kids are doing amazing things. Kids that sometimes I might have written off. I'm, I'm thinking 22 years, how great. What, what a celebration of someone that says, and I'm gonna to continue to learn along the way. Your district has made a tremendous commitment to this and your superintendent who could not be here um, because they, they're having a meeting in Washington, D.C. of all of the uh, superintendents. He did want to make a, this point with you all by um, videotaping his comments. And so I'm gonna ask you to enjoy uh, his thoughts on why we're here and your commitment to this and the district's commitment. Prepare students to succeed for life. Now, that's quite a, uh, that's quite a mission, isn't it? All students, um, not just some of them, not just the ones that come equipped and ready for us to deal with what they, uh, what they already know, but actually all kids who need our help. Um, I want you to turn to your neighbor very quickly, and I want you to just uh, answer this question, or I want you to respond to this quote. Anyone that's too busy to reflect is too busy to learn. Tell the neighbor next to you, do you believe that is a true statement? And then answer this next question as you're having that conversation. How do you make that happen in your classroom for kids? And then I wanna pull us back together with simply throwing my hand in the air, I'll announce that. That'll be our signal to come back together as you wind down that conversation. The quote is, anyone that's too busy to reflect is too busy to learn. Do you believe that to be true and how do you make that happen in your classroom? Have that conversation then we'll come back together. My hand in the air, hopefully you had a chance to visit with a neighbor about that concept. And thank you for coming back so quickly. You know, when your folks asked me if I would come in July to visit with you, I, I didn't even hesitate. Um, I had a lot on the calendar going on, but I looked at it and go, yeah, I'll come back to Kentucky. I mean, it's like getting me home, practically. Uh, I've worked so many days here in Kentucky, thanks to Greg and some other districts that have brought me in and some other towns that I've talked to. Um, but the real reason I came back is that I love working with professionals and I've always found in the GREC programs and other folks that, that I actually get to stand in front and work with people who are truly professionals in this work. And I wanna thank you for that right up front. Um, I believe that professionals would stop and reflect on their practices on a regular basis, that they will raise some questions. I, I ran across a quote, I was writing it down the other night. I got in really late and uh, on Wednesday night, I was on the West Coast where it was always dry and you know kind of warm. Got into Evansville, stepped off the plane, my glasses fogged up, and I go, whoa, I'm home, I'm home, <laughs> because Missouri has the same kind of humidity that you guys have, right? But I got to the hotel and I was unwinding and I was watching this video clip of a guy who was talking about a revolution in education, keeping America's promise, educating all kids. And that to do that, sometimes we might have to have a revolution. And he, he was given a, he was going through a quote from Abraham Lincoln. I just had to write it down, all right? It was uh, from December of 1862. And as you know from your history, that was quite a time in America. And uh, he didn't tell me in the video, he didn't tell us where exactly the group he, that Lincoln was talking to, but he says this, this is the quote. 
The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so must we think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we will save our country. Disenthrall ourselves. That's easier said than done. Disenthrall ourselves means to question the status quo. To disenthrall ourselves means to actually look at practices and say, is that the best one? Does that make sense? Is that something that gives us the kind of results that we're looking for in order to save kids, in order to prepare kids for their future, for success in their future? To disenthrall ourselves is something that I think a professional would do when they run across things that do not make sense when they look at practices that we might want to investigate in terms of is it really the best way of doing things for kids. In this session today, and we have this limited time, but beyond this session, I hope you will take that case of thinking anew and acting anew as you look at practices as a community. The idea of a professional learning community works simply like this. A group of people, adults, who want to act professionally with each other will come together on a regular basis and they will learn from each other. And as they learn from each other, they will have common goals to which they are striving for. So when I think about an organization, you right here are a professional learning community. You have the opportunity to learn from each other in this session today. Not only from your own school colleagues, but school colleagues from across your district. Back it up even further, and we can say, now let's get back into our building. So our entire building is also a professional learning community. And so when we meet together as a staff, we have that opportunity to learn from each other. We won't have staff meetings that are just sit and get and information. We'll have staff meetings that are learning meetings. And we'll ask some of our colleagues to share some of their best practices with each other during those learning meetings. And when we have questions about some practices, we'll actually dig into those practices. We'll do the study of what we need to study. I don't mean a book study. I mean we'll study the pieces of a book or the latest literature or the data or research that's out there. In a learning community, just to give you the broad spectrum of this, in the learning community, you actually stop and you ask yourselves, are we going to be driven and make decisions in this school based on data, research, current literature, because the world has changed, or are we going to be a school that just does it based on opinion? I run across schools that base it on opinion. And I heard Bob Aker, who is really one of the gurus of this thing, say, you know, Tim, in a professional organization, a professional learning community, not everyone's opinion holds equal weight. He says the opinions that we should really listen to are those that have the literature and the research and the data to back them up. So we would really think about as we learn together, we open ourselves up to not just opinions, but research. Let me give you an example. I was in a high school uh, in Missouri, and I said, you know, one of the big ideas is you'll have a focus on learning rather than teaching. What are some things, some actions? It's not a, just a, it's not a phrase. It is not something that just swirls around. It is a lens, and you take that lens and you put it over all your policies, all your practices, all your guidelines, all your strategies for assessment and curriculum and instruction. You ask yourself, does that give us learning? And I was asking this school, what kind of things have you done that really emphasizes this? They said, well, we have a homework policy. We all got on board with a homework policy that we think gives us a focus on learning. I said, great, what is it? We do not accept late work. Students who do not have their work done on time receive a zero in the grade book. That'll teach them. That'll help them learn. Turn to your neighbor. In terms of learning the content for what you want kids to have when they walk away from your classroom, giving a zero in the grade book with no other outcome, no other consequence, will that help kids learn? the content of your and the targets of what you're seeking. Turn to your neighbor, give them your thoughts. Be reflective of that particular policy. Does that have a focus on learning? And I will guarantee that the conversation will be filled with opinions about that practice. As a matter of fact, that school, that's how they based it. 
they got to talking about it because they say all the time, gosh, these kids aren't getting their work done. Some of them aren't turning it in, you know, this kind of thing. We've got to have, and so their answer was, we've got to have a policy. And so they made up this policy. They talked about it. And I heard, that the teachers told me this, and then we got tired of talking about it. And so we had a group of people that said, we'll write one. And these, this group gathered together and they pooled their opinions and this is what they came up with and they gave it to the principal and the principal didn't stop. He just said, okay, well, we've got the task force, task force recommendation. I'm gonna honor the task force re recommendation. And so now they were working over the policy that really doesn't help kids learn. I asked him to do a consensus with me. I said, give me a fist of five on that one. Five means you really love the idea. A fist means if you had the power to veto it, you would veto it. Now this was a smaller high school, but they had five hands with a five. That happened to be the task force. And they had 22 hands with a fist. And so we engaged in a practice that does not reach consensus with a staff that wasn't about, did you do some research and look at the current literature on what does work to hold kids accountable to their effort into what you want them to do? Or did you pool your opinions? Disenthrall yourselves, act anew, think differently. If the answer is to put zeros in the grade book, then you're grading behavior. You're not grading, do they know it? If you want to grade if they know it, put something in place in your school. We see schools all over the country who've addressed this, high schools, middle schools, elementary schools who have said, you know what, let's start holding kids accountable for this work. If it's important for them to practice it, to form their learning in their brain, then let's create an environment that causes them to do that. To not do that, to put zeros in, well, you guys know the answer to this one. Those kids who keep putting zeros in the grade book, do they keep getting zeros in the grade book? So your default answer of zeros in the grade book just doesn't work. And as a professional organization, professional learning community, you would look to learn differently and say, well, what else would we try? And these schools that put something in place and have their students be held accountable through an intervention where you say, you know what? I'm more determined that you're gonna do the work than you're determined that you're not going to do the work. You would have Mrs. Wanamaker in your classroom watching those people. Not watching them, but helping them. That was Mrs. Wanamaker was my middle school teacher who took on the directed study hall. She pulled herself off of the exploratory wheel, the other kids, and that was the perk. If you get your work done, if you're passing your classes, you're in the exploratory wheel, six weeks exploratory wheel, non-graded. We found out kids would do work and didn't have to grade it if you could make it interesting, relevant, and connect it to the learning of the day, right? So these teachers would do that. Mrs. Wanamaker pulled herself off of that. And when you went into Mrs. Wanamaker's directed study hall, she was not at the desk reading, her, reading the newspaper or scoring papers or planning for the next day. Mrs. Wanamaker was sitting with groups of kids and moving around the room and ensuring that they were getting their work done because what did they need? They didn't just need someone to supervise them. They needed someone to provide them more time and support. Think of this statement. We use it all the time. All kids can learn. How many of you think that's true? All kids can learn. And some kids need more time to learn and some kids need more support to learn. And it, it's up to us to provide that. It's not up to their parents to hire a tutor to do that. It's not up to the parents to do the homework with them because quite frankly, they're not in your classes. To say to and keep saying as we do sometimes in education, if only these parents, yeah, all kids can learn if only their parents would help them. Yeah, all kids could learn if they would buy a tutor. All kids could learn if it wasn't for the fact that they let them go off and do crazy things all the time. But listen, Parents are not with you. You know, if I, how many of you have said, boy, I just wish these parents would be more involved? We've all said that. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. As a principal, sometimes it's just, man, could we please come to, a, to the parent-teacher conference without having to drag you here? You know, that kind of stuff. And here's the reality. When we survey teachers, and we ask them, what's your number one thing you would like for parent involvement? They say, we would like more parent involvement. What's the number two thing about parent involvement? We'd like less parent involvement. <laughs> That's true. It's a survey <laughs> results. I mean, okay. So parents walk a very fine line of how involved do you want me to be? But the reality of the home is this. They are not in your classes. They don't know the discussion. They weren't there the day before for the pre-learning, right? They, they don't know the, the materials you used. 
So to expect the parent to do and help their child is kind of crazy when you think about it. We'd be very careful about what we asked kids to do outside of our classroom or our realm of influence because some parents are more involved than others. We would really question some homework that we send home. What is homework? Turn to your neighbor. Tell your, tell your neighbor what you think homework is all about. What should it be about would be the best question. What should homework be about? Okay. <laughs> Very quickly, 